Uh, welcome. Thank you, uh, Michelle, for this very nice introduction. Thank you, Minya. Thank you, Alec. So I thought I would start by showing a movie. This is supposed to be fun, right? So it's a, it's a movie called Rush Hour by Fernando Lynch. Okay, I think you get the idea, right? So, <laughs> so this is every controls engineer's dream, right? How would we get all these uh, interleavings of trajectories without any collisions? So well, that's what I do, control engineering, and I guess look at the audience. I know you all you all know that. So my goal is to control using information from sensors and sending the right control signals to actuators. But the models that we work with in the area of discrete event systems are discrete state models. And uh, for that reason, we borrow a lot of techniques from computer science and from operations research as well. And things get really complicated very quickly in that higher level control logic. So if your car, if you have a keyless entry uh, system for your car and you, you have a fob in your pocket and you get close to the door and then the door will unlock so you can open it, right? So that seems pretty simple. So we actually got the software code from an automotive supplier implementing that system and we, we built the state machine representation of the logic in the control code uh, and along with the discrete variables that are used, we counted over four billion reachable states just for that simple system. So this is just to say that the development of such uh, higher level control logic cannot be done after the coding in terms of testing, but rather if you have to introduce formal mathematical approaches right at the early in the design process. And you have to deal with what are called safety requirements. So that means nothing bad happens. So in the rush hour movie, there are no collisions. And you have to enforce liveness requirements. That is, you want something good to eventually happen. So you want people to reach their destination to cross the intersection, right? So what I thought I would do today in this, in this presentation, given the uh, 20 or so minutes that, uh, uh, that I have, is to discuss three themes in my research journey. And the first one, I called it interleaving and deadlock. And uh, let me explain, no, sorry, this went on, uh, this is the PowerPoint. Uh, let's see, it's doing the automatic uh, changing of slides. Okay, I should never use PowerPoint. Okay, so this goes back to my uh, graduate, uh, sorry, my graduate days at Berkeley when I was trying to work on control problems for stochastic linear systems, decentralized linear systems to be more precise, and I wasn't getting anywhere. I think Demos probably understands why. And then my advisor, a very smart man, came to me, uh, Eugene Wong, and he said, you know, you should probably look at control problems in, uh, in the area of database systems. And he told me there is this problem called concurrency control, where the goal is to control the interleaving of database transactions in such a way that you preserve the integrity of the data, because there is a correctness criterion, so you don't want overwrites, and you don't want uh, to uh, read corrupted data. So I studied that problem as a, as a grad student, and it was a chapter in my dissertation. And then when I graduated, or around that time, I also discovered the work that was done by Peter Ramage and Murray Wanham, based on Peter Ramage's thesis at the University of Toronto, supervised by, by Murray Wanham which they were trying to start a new area of control, right, for uh, control of discrete event systems and supervisory control. So I got really interested in that, and I didn't understand what the papers, uh, the mathematical framework, because I didn't have the right background. So I started reading a little bit about automata theory, and finally, when it clicked, I realized that what I had done in my dissertation, that chapter in concurrency control, could be recast in that theory in a much more elegant way, and that was the first paper that I actually authored as a faculty here as an assistant professor at Michigan. Moreover, this application of concurrency control gave us a lot of ideas to extend the theory as it was originally developed by Ramage and Wanham, especially the issue that we deal with in these, uh, in these uh, uh, 
problems where we have these interleavings is to think of it, maximize the interleavings, but at the same time, make sure everything behaves properly. So in discrete event systems, the, the problem occurs when we get what we call blocking. That is, we get to a state where we have a deadlock. Nothing, the, the, nothing can continue. There is, we have a circular weight situation among a set of a, uh, processes, for example. So if you try to get more concurrency, you can get so can someone tell me how to stop a, uh, an automatic timed uh, PowerPoint presentation? If it's in the view, you have to turn off the timing. So can you? Oh, you. Wait a minute. Can you, can you go up there? I want to take a picture. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Griswold Consulting on PowerPoint. So go under the slideshow. Use timings. Turn that off. Turn that off. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. I followed it. I followed it. Well, <laughs> this is one of the lessons I was going to tell you at the end of the talk. When you don't know, ask an expert, right? <laughs> so, the, so I was telling you there is this trade-off between trying to get more concurrency and then avoiding these blocking or deadlock situations. And so this is what we did when, and Enka Chen, who was my second PhD student, as was introduced earlier, that was the topic of his thesis. Now, interestingly, I returned to this idea of, of interleavings and, and uh, deadlock about 20 years later when um, my student at the time, In Wang, did an internship at HP Labs in California. And he was working in, in a group where uh, Terrence Kelly, also a former uh, Michigan graduate, Mike is nodding, he remembers Terrence, and then they, they brainstorm, and then they realize we could actually also look at deadlock avoidance in multi-threaded software using techniques from discrete event control theory. So we started that project, which was called the Gadara project, and the idea was as follows. So here in multi-threaded software, by the same argument as in the movie Rush Hour or in the work on concurrency control, you're trying to do, allow as many interleavings of your threads as possible. But these threads go and, and, and uh, access shared data. And therefore, you need a locking mechanism to preserve the integrity of the data. But if you have a locking mechanism, you can get in a situation of circular weight. So I'm waiting for you to do something. You're waiting for someone else to do something. And that person is, in turn, waiting for me. So programmers, when they write the code, they, don't always, they cannot always predict all these different interactions that could occur. Hence, there is a need to, well, first, deadlock happens. And second, you want to detect it and try to avoid it. So what we did was to take the uh, program source code and actually build, at compile time, a model of that source code, which we use for that the modeling formalism of PetriNets, which is another modeling formalism uh, in addition to automata and discrete event systems. And the idea is that once we had that model, then we could do our analysis using our, the techniques that we knew. So this is something that, so here again, I went to get an, ask an expert to help, or two experts. First, we teamed up with Stock, uh, Scott Malky, excuse me, of the Computer Science and Engineering Division here, who is a compiler expert. And then we went to also sought the help of Spiros Riveliotis of Georgia Tech, who is an expert in uh, deadlock avoidance problem in, 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 in uh, in uh, automated systems, in particular in the PetriNet formalism that we were using. So to make a long story short, what we were able to do is, from the PetriNet model, synthesize a control logic that would provably avoid deadlock based on that model. And then the, the neat feature here is we were able to embed that control logic into the program itself such that we, we obtain what we call an instrumented binary. So when the program was executing, there were these extra checks that we would do, which was the control logic. And these extra checks essentially were, were preventing threads from getting into a situation where deadlock would occur. So you could probably avoid deadlock, subject, of course, to the, uh, to the accuracy of your model. So the challenging part there was the uh, scalability of the control logic, the part in green, but also the uh, building the model at compile time from the control flow graph. So we were uh, happy that we made a cover feature in the IEEE computer that was way back in 2009 So for that work. So that's the first theme that I wanted to present today. The second one, I call it fault diagnosis and beyond. 
And again, there was a catalyst there. That was uh, Dr. Qasim Sinamohidin from Johnson Controls Research, who uh, convinced his company to, uh, to send him on sabbatical here, fully paid for a year, because he firmly believed that uh, the right approach for detecting faults in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems was actually to use discrete event models. And then I went to Demos and I said, does that interest you? And Demos said, absolutely. And we had two uh, PhD students in the group at that time, Mira Sampat and Rajas and Gupta, uh, both of them superbly talented. And we got this project started on fault diagnosis of discrete event systems. So the idea here is basically to do model-based inferencing used for a model that's in the form of a finite state automaton. So you have a system that generates events, but there are events going inside, on inside your system that are not observable to the outside world because of the limiting sensing capabilities. So you want to build a, what we call a diagnostic engine, that diag box there, that will do that model-based inferencing for you in an automated manner, knowing the system model and driven by the actual observations of the system. So we do model-based inferencing or, you know, every day in, 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 in our lives, but here the point is to do it in an automated manner. So based on what I'm observing and based on what I know about the structure of the system, it means that this fault that I did not see must have happened in the past, okay? So the diagnoser has three possible outputs. Yes, the fault has occurred. No, it has not occurred or I'm not sure, which could still be useful information. So at the time, we published uh, two papers uh, the whole group here, and uh, I put a third one at the top because we're preceding uh, our work and work that inspired us as well was that of Feng Lin at Wayne State University, not too far from here, who also uh, wrote this paper on diagnosability of discrete event systems. So that was the first paper on that topic, and that was a source of inspiration for us. Now I'll take a little sip of water. Now, continuing on with this theme, so Rajas and Gupta, who was one of the participants, joined UC Berkeley, where he is now a professor. And when he joined, he was involved in the uh, automated highway project. So I see some younger people in the room. You may not realize, but we actually had a successful test. We, the country, as of automated highways back in 1997, when there was this platooning, idea of platooning cars on dedicated lanes where these cars would follow each other at a very close separation, literally a few feet. And of course, they couldn't be human driven in that case. They had to be under automated uh, driving. And the idea was to increase the capacity on the highways, right? <clears throat> the throughput. So now Raja was participating in that project. And now if you, traditional control theory based on continuous uh, models will tell you that to maintain the stability of a platoon like that, you need to communicate the acceleration of every car, of the lead car, excuse me, to every car in the platoon. Otherwise, you, you are in danger of, uh, of collisions, especially as you go further back in the platoon, as the platoon gets longer. So that, man, that means that these cars have to communicate in real time. And of course, it has to be a wireless network, right? So therefore, to maintain the stability of the platoon, you must make sure your wireless communication network does not fail. So Raja says, well, we need to do diagnosis of the communication network itself. But that's a decentralized problem because now the information about the state of that network is spread over all these vehicles. They each make their own measurements. So Raja published some work on that topic and that got Demos and I with our student, Rami De Book, started on looking at decentralized information architectures for fault diagnosis, where you have a system that has several sites, for example, my platoon of cars, and you have several diagnostic modules, that's these blue boxes on, on the, the middle layer there. They do their own model-based inferencing based on the observations that they have from the system. And then potentially they can send some process data to a coordinator at the top, which may or may not be present. So the idea is you don't want to send all the raw data to the coordinator that would be replicating a central, I mean, if you can, you could do that, but that would be replicating a centralized architecture, but that may not be practical, right? So you would like to do to figure out how much processing should I do at the uh, level of the local diagnostic engines. And 
what to communicate, and what should the structure of the coordinator be. Maybe it shouldn't have any memory. It should be a simple Boolean function uh, combining information that you get. So with, other, with Rémi de Bouc and then Olivier Cantin, that was jointly with Demos, and later uh, with Shaika Gens, another former student of mine, we studied these architectures. And in particular, that idea of how much information to send to the coordinator, what are clever fusion rules, so that you can solve a larger class of problems. So the goal was here to figure out how to, you should proceed, what is your diagnostic protocol, quote unquote, so that you achieve the property of diagnosability. But then another student of mine realized, why don't we do that for control as well? That was TASIC U. And so we studied the same idea of doing control in a decentralized information manner, where you have several controllers we use the letter S because we call them supervisors because it's supervisory control, right? So each supervisor sees, gets some of the sensor information and can control some of the actuators. And it's possible that a given actuator may be controlled by two or more supervisors. So the idea is, again, what, how you, do you synthesize the, the, uh, the supervisors, their control actions, their, their strategies, so that together they work as a team. So here it's not a, a uh, it's a team problem. And um, similarly, you can imagine adding a communication network and having the supervisors communicate in real time. But then you have to decide which supervisor should communicate to which one and when and what information to send. And I see Harris nodding his head because he was on the PhD committee of my student, George Barrett, who studied these problems with uh, decentralized control with communication. So we did a lot of work on that, and most recently after, after George, uh, Weilin Wang, and uh, my most recent student, Xiang Yin, also looked at the idea of how to, at the problem of how do you synthesize these supervisors in a computationally efficient manner. So this was a big theme that kept us busy for over many years. And now comes the part about the title that discrete, which, what Michel thought the first time I said discrete event systems. And uh, the reason I call this discrete event systems is because we started to uh, study a property that was formulated in the computer science literature. It's called opacity. And opacity essentially means that you have a, a system that emits observations. And but there's something that is you want to keep secret about the system. So if someone is doing inferencing, so Think of, we just talked about doing model-based inferencing with diagnosers, right? So if someone is doing model-based inferencing based on some observations, you do not want that agent to detect uh, that you, uh, to, to, uh, to infer your secret, whatever your secret may be, and I'll give you an example in a second. So it's, it's like plausible deniability, okay? So, it's, so opacity by its nature is a property that can lead to, uh, it's very useful in the study of privacy properties. So, here, if you think of location-based services, when you go around with your phone, you know you're being tracked. You make queries to a server, and imagine a malicious observer uh, on the server, for example, then you would not want that, per that entity to figure out something secret about you, which could be your location here. So you don't want them to know that you are uh, uh, you know, here right now, but maybe you're in your office working or something like that, okay? So, of course, location privacy is just one example of opacity. Typically, in the problems that we worked on, you know, the, the secret is something about the current state of the system or maybe what was its initial state or something like that. So, this, this, is, this does not originate at Michigan, but we, we got very interested in that. And I had a PhD student a few years ago, Ichin Wu. And our idea was, well, if the system is not opaque, so if the secret gets revealed somehow, how would we prevent that from happening? We do not want to control the system and change its behavior because you don't want to constrain the, the system. So we thought, well, how about adding an output interface that we called an obfuscator? And that output interface would insert fictitious events in the output stream. And even maybe it would have the ability of erasing certain, output, certain events output by the system but not doing that in a way that uh, is random, 
but in a way that the modified behavior is legitimate behavior consistent with the system model. So that's very important. So it's not fake news. It's something that's actually consistent with the system model. Okay? So the question that comes up is, how do you design that, that blue box there, in, again, in an automated manner, given a particular model of your system, a set of observations, and the secrets of the system? So we've been able to make uh, quite a lot of progress on that over the last few years. So currently, two of my PhD students who are here today are working on various aspects of that problem. That's Yiding Ji and Romulo Mera Goes, and also several postdoctoral students, including uh, Blake Rawlings, who is here, and Sahar Mohajirani, who could not be here. And so I, we decided, since location privacy is a very natural concept and is something that uh, everyone can relate to, we decided, why don't we illustrate our approach, our uh, synthesis techniques for obfuscator uh, using location privacy, so with very uh, smart undergraduate students uh, with very good programming skills and, and Blake's help, we created this app here, which works as follows. So it uses the GPS in your, in your iPad, for example, and you, you go outside. This is, a, you probably recognize the North Campus Diag, and uh, you select an area that you zoom in, and then you select a grid size that you is, is uh, adequate for your, for your objective. Be I, why do we have a grid? It's because we discretize everything, right? This is discrete event systems. So we, um, then here's what we do. So we, you, as a user, you can specify your secret cell in the grid, which is the red one here, and you can specify obstacles, such as the black ones. And then you start moving around, and that is the, uh, Hold on, where's my mouse? I lost my mouse. Oh, there it is. So the, um, this is a trajectory that the user is going to follow, which goes through the secret, right? So the user starts moving. So you see the, uh, the, the, the little circle. And then the, uh, the blue diamond is the discretized position, so which cell is the user in. And the uh, purple diamond is the obfuscated position that you would reveal to the outside world. That your, that your edit function has calculated. So I should say that when this starts, when the user specifies the grid, we go back and we calculate all the obfuscated moves that are legal for all the legal moves of the user. So we pre-compute all of that. It takes a few seconds. And then when the user is moving, we just query the server that, that source that solution. And then we report the obfuscated trajectory in that purple color. And here we put a constraint that the obfuscated position should not be more than uh, one cell away from the, from the true position. And when the user makes one move, we allow the obfuscated, uh, obfuscator to move three, three, to do three move, up to three moves if necessary. So this works in real time. So, so some of you think I, I only do theory, but actually here, thanks to the help of good programmers, we have something that, that is uh, an interesting way of illustrating uh, 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 opacity and opacity enforcement by obfuscation, which is one of the methods for doing that. So I'm getting close to my time limit, but we're doing good. So what are some of the lessons learned from these three research teams? First one, regarding interleaving and deadlock, I think, I still believe that the next frontier for control theory is to control the execution of software. I think there's a lot more that can be done. But of course, as my wife mentioned, we don't have the computing power to solve all the problems that we, uh, that we encounter. So, but that's good. I look at it, it gives me job security, right? So the second theme, fault diagnosis and beyond, to me, it's about in understanding information structures. And this is something I learned from Demos. It's not the class of mathematical models that, that you work with. It's really the information structure of the problem and uh, that reveals the, the underlying features and uh, that guides you towards the solutions. And in the theme of discrete REET event systems, I think it's, it's, you can do a lot with very simple concepts. Opacity is a very intuitive notion. It's easy to define mathematically, but you can get a lot out of that. And opacity enforcement is actually a fascinating problem. So I'm not bad, I'm at a little under 19 minutes, so that's good. 
So now I'd like to move on to the acknowledgement section, but I'll take a sip of water. Okay. Well, first, I would like to thank uh, our Dean, Alec Gallimore, for, uh, for this great honor, as well as all the secret, quote unquote, but not opaque, uh, committee or people who advise the Dean on, on these matters. Um, I've been here long enough to know that there are superbly talented faculty in this College of Engineering. And I know that there's very few of these uh, professorships, so it, I'm really very, very honored to be standing here today. Now, you're probably wondering what this picture is about. Uh, I usually park in the Lurie lot, and one morning I was coming to work, and that was just very soon after Alec was named our new dean. He had not officially started. And I thought, this is a fantastic shot, given that our dean is a rocket scientist, right? <laughs> So Peter Keynes was my master's thesis advisor at McGill University. Eugene Wong was my uh, PhD advisor. I mentioned him already at Berkeley. And Demos Tenekedzis, of course, we, we all know him. He's my uh, colleague and friend for the past 32 years. Uh, these three individuals are, are amazing scholars, very distinguished scholars. And they have at least two things in common. Number one is they have the highest academic standards. And number two is they have unquestionable integrity. So they have been uh, superb role models for me, and I've learned a lot from them. So, And I wouldn't be standing here if it were not for the uh, talents and efforts of my PhD students. I mentioned some of them in my presentation. I could not cover the whole spectrum of work, so they're all here. Some of them were crew supervised. And the two in blue are, are on their way one or two more years. And of course, I've also had a lot of research collaborators. And here I mentioned some people who, who came to Michigan for extended stays. Or uh, more recently, I've also had a, the, the, the good fortune to have a lot of uh, several post very talented postdoctoral researchers in my group. So, and I've made friends from all over the world. And I put in bold here Fang Lin from Wayne State University because I've done more, more work with him than with anyone else over the past 32 years. So. Now, Alec introduced Harris earlier. So my introduction for Harris is, is he's a professor and a gentleman. And so when you think of the job of a faculty, you think of research, teaching, and service, right? So a three-legged stool. But my, my stool or my idea of a faculty is the stool should have five legs. That's because there are two legs for teaching, undergraduate teaching and graduate teaching. And there are two legs for service. There is service to your department, college, university, and then the, so the internal service, and then all of the external service to your professional community. And as uh, Alec pointed out, I think in Harris's case, you know, each of these five legs is rock solid. And I encourage you to read the memoir that he wrote and posted on his website. It is fascinating. I actually taught an undergraduate class many times using one of Harris's undergraduate textbook, State Models of Dynamic Systems. And Harris also served on the dissertation committees of some of my students, including Enka Chen, as I was mentioned earlier. And in his book, there is a chapter on discrete event systems. It's called Discrete Time and State Models. Right. So, so Harris, I, uh, thank you very much for agreeing that this professor should be named after you. So these are my closing comments. Cliches become cliches for a reason, right? So, and for the third one, you'll have to ask me offline. I'll explain to you what I mean by that. Demos knows. So I want to thank all the staff that's worked so hard to prepare for this event, in particular, Stacy Printon, Catherine June. Where is she? Oh, there you are. And then Ann Stalls also. For, and I see Shelly and Judy in the back. So thank you very much. I want to thank my wife, Michelle, my children, those who are not here, and all the La Fortune family. <laughs> this is just uh, from uh, late August. 
So thank you all very much. Merci beaucoup.